All right, people are still trickling in, but I think I'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us at our DOE Laboratories of the Future workshop on mechanics of innovation. My name is Susanna Howison, and I'm the director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Interagency Coordination in the Office of Science at DOE. Uh, next slide. Just going to quickly give uh, remind everyone what the Laboratories of the Future is. Uh, hopefully, you've heard um, me speak about this before, but it's essentially a visioning exercise in which we ask the question, if we were to establish the lab system today, what would we do? How would we do it? How would they be organized? Where would the laboratories be located? What would their missions be? How would they work together? Uh, how would they work with their um, partners, either locally or nationally or internationally? If we think about their campuses, would they be open or closed or even virtual? And what would their workforce makeup uh, be? So in the process of doing this, we have uh, spoken to uh, about 150 stakeholders at this point from all different uh, aspects of science and technology. And we are also starting to hold a series of workshops. And the point of these is to expose you know, the broader community to the different ideas that we've collected around what a future laboratory could be. Our first workshop on scientific architecture was a great success and as well as was our second looking at the geography of innovation where we talked about innovation districts and cluster models and how you know different in, different institutions can leverage each other to become uh, some greater than the whole. And today we're going to be talking about the mechanics of innovation. Um, we're going to hear from a number of speakers who will talk about lessons learned from technology transfer at universities and programs that bridge the gap between researchers and industry. These include entrepreneurship training, startup accelerators, and innovation ecosystem development. But first, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our guest host, who is the uh, Connor Prochaska, he is the DEO, DOE Chief Commercialization Officer and the Director of the Office of Technology Transitions. He, prior to OTT, he served as Senior Advisor and Chief of Staff of the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, or ARPAE. And before joining DOE, he was the Senior Vice President and Associate General Counsel at a public investment fund where he led fund operations. And prior to that, he served as an intelligence officer in the United States Navy, obtaining the rank of lieutenant. And now over to you, Connor. Great, thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, good morning to everybody or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it, it's really exciting to be here uh, and talk about innovation. I always give the joke when, I, when I'm walking, if anybody's ever watched Animaniacs and hears uh, Pinky in the brain and says, well, what are we gonna do today? Pinky and uh, you know when I, I my joke with my wife is well what do you think I'm going to talk about and she's going to say innovation um, so what are we going to talk about today innovation Department of Energy it's exciting um, my name is Connor Prohaska I am the Chief Commercialization Officer for the Department of Energy and the Director of the Office of Technology Transitions uh, both the Department of Energy and the Office of Technology Transitions have names as a lot of government bureaucracies have they're a little misleading. And I think it's always important to talk about that at the very beginning, particularly when we're talking about what is the Department of Energy or a national lab of the future look like, is understanding what our role is, where we are, where we're going, and what our responsibility is to particularly the U.S. taxpayers uh, as our number one constituent and funder uh, when we talk about the Department of Energy and our national labs. So first off, you know, I think most people that interact with the national labs understand that the Department of Energy is wildly misnamed. It really is the Department of Nuclear Weapons Security and the Department of Research and Innovation or Research and Technology. Um, we are the largest uh, complex of, of, of basic science, funder of basic science in the world. Uh, with the 17 national labs, we spend roughly $20 billion a year on research and development uh, across the board from uh, high efficiency solar technology to neutrino science and experiments to understand what happened after the Big Bang and everything in between. So when we talk about that and we talk about what is the role of, of uh, my role as the first chief commercialization officer for the Department of Energy and the new expanding role 
of the Office of Technology Transitions, which was created in 2015, but we've really uh, doubled or tripled down, however you want to look at it, um, not just in personnel, but funding, because it is an admission that people are interested in on the Hill, people are interested in at the uh, White House, at both sides of Congress, um, and we, we see this as, as something that is not a flash in the pan, but really has been a steady uh, uh, understanding that we need to take a little bit less of a laissez-faire attitude, particularly at the Department of Energy, with what we do with our basic science and research, and be more purposeful to maximize the impact of the U.S. taxpayers' research dollar that flows through the department. So with, with that as an understanding and what we do at the Techno Office of Technology Transitions, um, we really attack this problem in three buckets, uh, promotion, access, um, and also policy. Now, the one I usually don't add in there, but is important to what we're talking about here today with the mechanics of innovation is also awareness. Uh, and it's not awareness necessarily of, of the world, it's self-awareness. It's understanding what we are doing at the Department of Energy. Um, one of the things that I think most people that go to 1000 Independence Avenue and to the beautiful Forest Stall building, um, which if you've seen it, you know I'm being sarcastic. Uh, when you go to, to Forest Stall in the headquarters of the Department of Energy, um, the first thing you realize is it's very hard to get your hands around everything we're doing at the department. Um, it, 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 there's so many things. And so when we're talking about what do the national labs of the future look like, I think that is one of the places we have to start. We have to have a better awareness of what we're doing. When we talk to our constituency groups from OTT uh, across the board, uh, whether it's you name the industry. When we talk to them, one of the things that, that we often hear is, wow, I didn't know the Department of Energy did that. And frankly, we don't either sometimes, and we have to learn as well. And, and one of the, the goals that I've taken, and it's, it's probably because I'm a glutton for punishment here a little bit, is the Office of Technology Transitions is, is working to get less people to say, I didn't know the Department of Energy did that. Notice I didn't say nobody says that because that'll never happen, but less. So uh, if, if you didn't know we did it, hopefully we can rank you into, into the, the stack of people that we've, we've hopefully promoted and, and evangelized to a little bit here about what the department does. So I think first and foremost is we have to understand that we need a better mechanism and a better way to understand what we're doing as a department. That's just crucial to our function as, as, as a Department of Energy. Um, when we also talk about where the department was created, where it's going, what's happening, is I think we always have to recognize what the department does at its core and what our national labs do at their core is solve big problems. Uh, in the 1930s uh, and 40s, it was solving a weapons problem for a war. Uh, in the 70s, it was energy. Uh, and it continues to be energy, obviously, but there's a number of problems. At the beginning of the COVID uh, crisis, you know, one of the immediate questions we had to ask is, how do we get the Department of Energy's national labs back to a crisis Footing. How do we get them to be quick reacting, um, a little bit uh, of a deviation off of their long roadmaps that they have for a lot of science and innovation um, to, to actually attack a problem right now? And we, we, we did that um, successfully in some ways, but, but we're doing ourselves a disservice if we said we did it perfectly, right? There's opportunities to improve, and that's a big part of what Suzanne is doing, and, and I'm really excited about that. Because the, the, the discussions that we have here with a great panel and, and all these workshops um, will solve future crises. And, and these are not small problems. These are humanitarian problems, uh, problems actually, you know, that, that, that affect all of humanity in general. Um, and so the importance of this work can never be underestimated because it truly changes the world. Um, the, the talent of the people involved uh, is very important. And I, I want to touch on that just a little bit. Um, when we talk about being the world leader as a science complex and a basic science complex, that means we need to make sure that we retain, we have the best brains in the world. Uh, we have the best facilities. We need the best facilities for those best brains in the world. And we also need to make sure that we're doing uh, justice to, to the system and the mechanics of how we interact with the scientific community. Um, the world is changing just as, General Motors 60 years ago, you went to work there and you probably stayed there until you retired. Uh, the similar kind of thought process was at a, a lot of our national labs. And I think everybody recognizes that that's not necessarily what the, the new generation of, of scientists and researchers are looking for. 
there's uh, an entrepreneurship aspect to it that we deal with a lot at the Office of Technology Transitions uh, through our Energy i program or other opportunities. It's an ecosystem. And so how do we make sure that we have, back to the policies uh, discussion and, and one of those three buckets that we attack, how do we have the right policies that, that look at conflicts of interest? Um, how do we make sure that we have uh, the greatest minds in our country and in the world, frankly, at, at the bench, um, on the bench and at the bench, so that when the time comes and they're called on by the United States to solve a big crisis, uh, they're there and we have them at our disposal. I think that's important. In that same vein, we have to make sure that we have the world-class facilities, the world-class opportunities, and the world-class um, uh, uh, atmosphere um, that they're expecting and that they should deserve, that they do deserve and that they should get um, as, as we go forward. Um, and so I think that's a lot of the discussion. How do we make sure that the national labs um, are, are looking like some of, the, some of our competitors, uh, to use that term, uh, a little broadly um, in the private sector um, so that we can make sure that those national labs are there. So uh, in short, I think breaking down silos, ensuring that the, the national labs uh, can collaborate effectively and efficiently um, with the community and with each other um, because they do have data, they have access to tools that, that, that is not uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, but how can they do that? How do we have world-class facilities? Um, and how do we make sure that there is not such a strict firewall between going to the private sector and coming into our national labs and going in between? Because that entrepreneurial spirit that we, that we are uh, experiencing, not just in this generation, but also at the national labs, um, how do we move the innovation out that includes making sure that people can stay fluid and ideas can stay fluid. We work to make sure that people maximize our facilities at the Department of Energy, make sure that they maximize our people and our research and the opportunities that exist. Um, I, I really just wanna thank everybody <clears throat> that's listening, that's also participating in these. Thank you so much, Susanna, for your great efforts um, because this is, this is really great um, and, and, and we're really eager to to make sure that we take any of these learnings and, and, and things that we talk about to, to put them into action because um, this work that we're doing, as I mentioned again, and can't, uh, we can't underestimate how important this work is because uh, there will be problems in the future. And when these problems pop up, um, it's dependent on us now to set a solid foundation for the national labs of the future to solve the problems of humanity um, and to make the world a better place at the end of the day. People throw that around a lot, but. Uh, people at the national labs can, can sleep confidently at night that they are doing that. And so thank you to the panelists. Thank you for your input. Um, and thank you, Susanna, for, for tackling this, this very, very important subject, because uh, I know that I and uh, I have a, a baby boy on the way in February, and we're dependent on making sure that the national labs of the future can solve the problems that, that he'll face. So thank you very much for having me today. Please never hesitate to reach out to the Office of Technology Transitions and OTT um, as your front door to the Department of Energy to find the best place where you can cooperate uh, and, 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 and collaborate with the department. That's what we're here for. So thank you very much and everybody have a blessed and great day. Thank you so much, Connor. That was a great introduction. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad you were able to come today to fill in for our director, Chris Fall. Um, so next, we will be hearing from Dr. Steven Sosalska, the Chief Executive Officer of Autumn, which was formerly known as the Association of University Technology Managers. Autumn is a nonprofit leader in efforts to educate, promote, and inspire professionals to support the development of academic research that changes the world and drives innovation forward. Steve works to ensure that Autumn serves the needs and interests of its members through strategic planning, outreach, and advocacy while empowering association members and promoting the profession. Before joining Autumn, Steve served as the Associate Director for Com Commercialization at Wake Forest Innovations, where he was responsible for commercializing high impact inventions and drafting, negotiating, executing a wide variety of licensing and startup transactions. Uh, thank you and over to you, Steve.
Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It, it was really interesting listening to uh, Connor describe um, all the initiatives at the Department of Energy, because they really mimic a lot of initiatives that we've been seeing at the university uh, level as well. This idea of focusing on innovation, entrepreneurship, providing the space, the ecosystem, uh, and the environment uh, to be successful in that. So I look forward to uh, talking to you about um, certain aspects of uh, technology transfer within a university setting. So let me share my screen with you here. Um, and so hopefully you can see that. Uh, and so uh, as Susanna mentioned, I'm the CEO of Autumn. Uh, Autumn is a nonprofit association uh, that's composed of about 3,000 different members. Uh, they actually arise from about 65 different countries. Uh, the majority of them, however, are within the United States and uh, include uh, university tech transfer professionals, uh, federal lab uh, tech transfer professionals, venture capitalists, angel investors, industry, uh, and other aspects of uh, the critical innovation ecosystem. What I'd like to do today is that I'd actually like to talk you through what Autumn has been focusing on and uh, different strategies um, and uh, aspects of technology transfer that I think will be useful uh, as we uh, embark upon this uh, uh, national laboratories of the future. So um, briefly, uh, our mission uh, is very simply to support and advance technology transfer globally. As I mentioned, uh, that includes university tech transfer, federal lab tech transfer, uh, and other nonprofit tech transfer, be it research institute or hospitals. Um, now, uh, looking at some of the people on the, on the uh, panel right now, as well as uh, on the uh, attendee list, I see uh, there are a number of Autumn members, so everybody's probably fairly familiar with technology transfer. But I think it's helpful to actually reach out. Um, and, and described in a little more detail. So although you might not know every aspect of tech transfer, I guarantee you that it has impacted every single person on this call. And so let's just go through a couple of quick examples. Any of you that suffer from seasonal allergies uh, and are thankful that you can actually go outside uh, in the spring uh, and not uh, suffer, you can actually thank Georgetown University that actually created uh, the active ingredient for what's now known as Allegra. Uh, for those of you that might have children uh, that hate getting their flu shots, uh, like mine do, you can thank the St. Louis School of Medicine and the University of Michigan for the development of the flu mist, uh, which has been a, a, a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful uh, item that has been used by my family and many others going forward. Um, for those of you that might have a family member or a friend uh, that's been trying to kick the habit, you can thank UCLA uh, and the nicotine patch. These are just a couple of examples of university inventions that have actually developed into products that have really changed the world uh, positively. However, it's not just universities that are making these changes. For example, uh, DARPA. Uh, many of you may or may not know that Siri was actually initially developed uh, at DARPA uh, as that personal assistant software, which then, of course, um, has now accelerated into that Alexa that's sitting on your uh, kitchen table right now. Just another example of uh, an innovation that has now provided um, a, a new product line, a new service available to society. But it's not just uh, uh, DARPA and, and uh, federal labs like that. Department of Energy actually has uh, a number of different products that have arisen from research um, uh, taking place on uh, those uh, labs as well. And this is actually uh, one of the more interesting examples to me. Uh, so Boston Scientific reached out to the National Energy Technology Laboratory because they were interested in creating a stronger um, coronary stent. Uh, they wanted a stent that would be more visible um, when x-rayed, and so they actually reached out to the uh, NETL uh, that developed this coronary stent. That stent is now in people uh, across the world, and in fact, it's generated over $3 billion uh, in revenue. And again, it's, it's an invention that uh, helped, uh, was, uh, helped to be uh, arisen from uh, national labs that was based on this platinum uh, chromium technology. So again, just another example of uh, technology transfer that's been awfully successful uh, and has changed the world. So, you know, I probably don't need to go too far into this, but I actually want to, 
So why is technology transfer important? Now, again, if you have seasonal allergies or kids who hate shots, uh, there's, a, there's a number of reasons already, but there's more than just that societal benefit. And clearly there is a ton of societal benefit when these innovations are actually turned into products and services that are changing the way we live, work and play. But it's not just the societal benefit that's been an uh, advantage of technology transfer, but it actually is also an extension of those mission objectives that happen at the agency or lab uh, level. So you've got things that you're focused on within that agency or lab level, but then there are often these dual use opportunities for those innovations that um, your researchers have been working on over the years that can now extend into other areas. So again, this idea of coronary stents or Siri <clears throat> as two examples. But it's not just societal benefit and fulfilling the mission objectives. There's actually an entire economic development aspect of this. And so when I talk about economic development, I'm, I'm thinking about things like brand new startup companies that are being formed. Autumn keeps track of this and, and we show over a thousand startup companies uh, are developed out of university, federal labs, other nonprofit um, uh, institutions in the US alone each year. And those job, uh, those uh, companies lead to new job opportunities, which have also had a substantial economic benefit um, for your colleague, uh, your best friend, or a community college graduate uh, within your town. Another thing that tech transfer does, and I don't want to get into every single one of them, but another really important aspect of technology transfer is it is a great way to develop future alliances with industry. I know that's an area of, of interest. And so, again, this Boston Scientific is a great example, but there are others where um, national labs work with industry to develop uh, these new uh, products and services going forward. And then finally, if uh, for, for those researchers on the call, you know, at the end of the day, you've been working on a particular area of uh, interest um, and you've been developing perhaps a, a, a new compound, uh, a new method. Uh, and yes, everybody wants their, their paper in science or, or in nature, uh, and nature, um, but actually the culmination of the research in my mind is actually you've turned that innovation into a product or service that is actually being used by society at large. And so again, these are all aspects of technology transfer, which are just incredibly important as we go forward. And um, I, I don't wanna get into the whole, uh, the wheel of technology transfer, and it is this virtuous cycle that just keeps going in circles around and around and around. But here's just a couple of examples of uh, the, the benefits that technology transfer provided. So you can see uh, in, the, in the upper left-hand corner about 11 o'clock, um, about $72 bi um, uh, billion dollars in research expenditures were expended in 2018 alone. Uh, the majority of that actually came from federal um, uh, 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 research. So that's money that's funded by taxpayers like me and you um, that took place at national labs or universities. That led to inventions. Those inventions led to uh, protectable uh, types of intellectual property like patent applications. But most importantly, those led to license agreements with third parties that would take that national lab or university early stage invention and actually develop it into that product or service. And you can see in 2018 alone, over 800 new products hit the market because of technology transfer. Um, and as you can see, if we keep going around, um, you know, over a thousand startups, as I mentioned earlier, and these are, are high quality startups that stick around. So you can see we've had, you know, 6,500 startups in the U.S. only um, that continue to exist, provide employment opportunities um, and new product uh, and uh, service opportunities uh, for society. So again, examples of how technology transfer is really changing things uh, going forward. So it's not just that you know, one year aspect of this, but one of the things Autumn has done is in conjunction with the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, we've actually looked at the economic impact 
of technology transfer, uh, and that's nonprofit technology transfer. And what we've seen is through you know about a 22-year period that's accounted for about $865 billion to the GDP and up to 5.9 million jobs. Um, so clearly technology transfer has a ton of impact, both at the agency level, the society level, the economic uh, level, uh, and, and clearly the countrywide level. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those statistics as we go forward. So then the question becomes, all right, how do we actually culture that, um, uh, that innovation within your national labs? And uh, Susanna asked me to um, uh, speak to uh, describe some of the university approaches that we've used to develop this uh, culture of innovation across uh, the campus. So when I think about that, I often think about bottom up and top down uh, innovation strategies. You really, you kind of want to meet in the middle as opposed to just pushing one way or the other. So if we think about it from a bottom up strategy, and so from a university standpoint, this would be maybe focusing on uh, graduate students, maybe at the national lab, it's the early stage um, uh, researchers or the, uh, the, the postdocs that, that might be uh, on your campuses those are often the next generation of scientists that are developing these new innovative ideas. So how do you get them? How do you reach out to them? How do you pull them into, uh, uh, into the innovation ecosystem? And so what we found is there are a couple of different ways you could do this. And depending on your particular national lab, um, uh, maybe some of these strategies work better than others. So one of the things that we found really works within a university system is technology transfer internships. And so briefly, all that means is you have a researcher that's working in a particular national lab or perhaps in a department in a university that'll spend a couple of hours um, a, a week or so in, in the technology transfer office learning about the technology transfer process. That person then becomes an ambassador. And so when she goes back to her lab uh, or to um, uh, her department, she becomes someone who just gets that uh, department or lab thinking um, along that technology transfer axis. We found it been, it's been really valuable to have seminar series uh, where innovators across, uh, say, a university campus uh, or a national lab describe the type of research they're doing and any innovative aspects. Um, and one of the things, at least within a university system, that's worked out really well um, is there's been um, uh, connections with the business school or the law school or the, or the uh, scientific graduate school um, on uh, advancing these types of technology transfer ecosystem uh, building endeavors, whether it's patent law or commercializing innovation courses. Uh, again, from National Labs, one of the things I hope you take away from this presentation is working with uh, the local universities uh, in your area um, to help support that. Uh, that's an area that I'm sure they'd be very interested in. And of course, in these days of uh, uh, working uh, across disciplines, um, it's probably uh, likely that many of your researchers might be working with university professors um, across the uh, region and, and the nation. Um, and then, of course, networking opportunities. The more networking opportunities you can provide, the better. Uh, uh, innovation today is multidisciplinary and the more chances you get to put those people together, the better. So in addition to those um, bottom up, you also have top down approaches. And so one of the things that's, that's really refreshing to hear from, from Connor um, uh, and others is, is this idea of wanting to actually push that down. So talking about innovation policy implementation, you know, one of the key drivers of that is that conflict of interest, especially within a national lab setting. The fact that that's being addressed from the top down is a great indicator of the importance of uh, innovation and technology transfer um, on your labs. And so here I've got some other examples. So um, if your national labs already don't have um, presentations by your technology transfer office, um, once a year, once every couple of years, I, I really would um, advocate for that because it just gets you thinking in that frame of mind. 
Um, and uh, prototype development is one of the newer areas in universities that's really been um, an area of interest. And so briefly, what that means is when an innovation is received from that tech transfer office, it's generally pretty early stage. And it's great to be able to develop that, de-risk that technology, to make that technology more valuable when the uh, tech transfer professional goes out to industry um, uh, to market that invention. So this idea of, of setting aside money for prototyping um, or development um, at the tech transfer office level really important um, and has been shown to be very helpful. And then of course the, the last piece is celebrate your successes. Um, I, I don't know how many of you knew about the coronary stent and I'm sure at your individual labs you've got other examples. Well everybody should know about those. Those are just examples of the importance of your research and the impact it has on society. So if we go forward, um, you know, how can you continue to just uh, create or infuse this culture of innovation? And so I talked briefly about it, but just to, to put a point on it, um, this idea of cultivating your local soil. So yes, within your um, framework, you've got really qualified um, uh, uh, researchers, you've got wonderful equipment, um, you've got clear focus, but that's not the only thing you have in your region you've got other areas. So reach out, think about how the rest of that community can fit in with uh, DOE uh, initiatives as we go forward. So, you know, look at the economic soil. You know, each uh, region is, is known for a particular area. Um, there are different talents and strengths within different regions. You know, reach out to those. Um, if you've got community colleges, um, you know, reach out to those groups um, uh, as, as potential workers in future startup companies, uh, or perhaps even new employees downstream. And as I mentioned before, you know, uh, universities are uh, a great resource that I hope you do tap into, uh, and you'll find uh, you'll be warmly received. In addition to, to that cultivation, there's also coordination. And so these kind of go hand in hand. Um, but as you know, ecosystems are not just one component, so that federal lab is important, but the environment in which that lives in is important. So whether it's the universities that we talked about, but then there are all these different aspects and, and some of the other panelists would be talking about kind of that entrepreneurial development or workplace development going forward. Um, and I really want you to consider that as you drive towards more innovation and more focus um, on advancing those innovations uh, forward. Um, uh, one area that I, I wanted to stress is um, local chambers of commerce. Uh, so most of um, the federal labs will be in areas with uh, uh, chambers of commerce. I found those to be really valuable, um, uh, neutral areas where innovation leaders can get together. Um, and talk about those um, uh, uh, issues that are of importance to that community. So that's, that's an area that if you haven't reached out to your chamber, I, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, moving on, um, co-location. Now I realize um, sometimes there, there might be some security issues around this. Uh, and again, this is where universities are really valuable. Um, they want people to come onto their campuses. Chamber of Commerce is another great example of um, a, a uh, convener of people. The more you could do this, the more uh, exchange of ideas, intellectual connections uh, that you get going forward. So um, if, if you're just staying within your uh, lab, I really encourage you um, to, to get out there. You know, sit on your um, uh, different uh, community groups um, and, and work with those other universities or companies in the areas or, again, you know, local uh, government uh, areas uh, that, that might be useful going forward. Just really engage the community in which you're, you're a part of. Um, there are, a, as you can see, uh, and I'm trying to, to whiz through these, but there are a ton of resources uh, for you um, should you be interested in advancing uh, particular innovations forward. Of course, Autumn is a resource, and I'll, I'll give a link a, a little later on. Um, but one of the resources I hope everybody knows about um, is the Federal Laboratory Consortium for Technology Transfer, the FLC. Um, and so that is a consortium that the DOE uh, is already a part of, um, and they have tremendous resources that I encourage you to reach out 
uh, to. Uh, specifically, um, and if you just go to federallabs.org, uh, you'll see this. Um, there is a great resource called FLC Business, which actually highlights the technologies available um, uh, from labs across the country, as well as other resources available. So if you're a researcher and you're kind of stuck in a certain area or you want to reach out and see what other people are doing, uh, use this wonderful resource to actually just see who else is out there, provides contact information, you can reach out to them. So uh, again, tons of resources out there. If I kind of summarize uh, what I've, I've quickly given you a scattershot of, um, it's you know, a couple of main points. You know, one, technology transfer has multiple positive outcomes. It's not just that one product. It's not just that connection to your mission. Um, it's a whole suite of positive benefits. Uh, and so again, I'm thrilled whenever I hear uh, agencies are putting a focus on that commercialization of those innovations. Um, please use the university uh, or, <clears throat> excuse me, nonprofit community as that partner uh, to extend your reach. Um, and, you know, as I, I mentioned, cultivating, coordinating, co-locating, that'll just enhance your mission um, and expand your scope, which is exactly what you want to do. And as I mentioned, a couple of resources I want you to be aware of in addition to Autumn. Um, uh, again, uh, FLC uh, is, a, is a tremendous resource. And so with that, I'm just going to put up my contact information briefly, uh, and then I'll turn it back over to uh, Susanna. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, Steve. That was great. I really appreciated learning about uh, your perspective from university technology transfer. So next, we are going to hear from Dr. Ruth Schumann. She's a program director for i program at the National Science Foundation. Ruth joined the National Science Foundation in August 2009 as an SBIR STTR program director. Before coming to NSF, she was the founder, president, and CEO of a successful venture-backed life science company, Gentra Systems, that developed, manufactured, and sold products for genetic testing and research to clinical and research laboratories worldwide. She began her career as a faculty member at North Carolina State University and was a pioneer in the development of gene transfer and genetic engineering technology. Over to you, Dr. Schumann. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Susanna. Let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen here a second. All right. I think I've got it. Can you see it? Looks great. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Susanna, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your uh, future Laboratories of the Future workshop. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Susanna said, I, um, I've been at NSF for a while. I started as an SBIR program director. I've actually uh, changed responsibilities to the i -Corps program as an i -Corps program director about a uh, little over a year ago, so I'm still uh, relatively new to this program. Uh, and I share this program with Andre Marshall, who is also a program director in the i -Corps program. And you might see us both from time to time uh, doing these sorts of presentations. So uh, let me start by just talking a little bit about the i -Corps program vision which I think is uh, you know, very relevant to your discussion today and, and in thinking about uh, laboratories of the future. The goal of the program uh, when it started and continues today was really to uh, reduce the risk associated with translating technologies from the laboratory to the marketplace. And um, initially this program was envisioned as a program to help NSF funded researchers, that is people who have received NSF funding for basic uh, science and engineering uh, technologies to help them evaluate whether there was a commercial opportunity for the technologies they've developed. Uh, I uh, can tell you that this uh, program was actually uh, first envisioned by a program director in the SBIR program at NSF, Errol Arkelich. Errol uh, was a colleague of mine. I was very fortunate to have him stop by my office and talk about the 
uh, what he uh, hoped to accomplish with the I-Corps program um, and uh, uh, actually uh, was able to see some of the very first uh, the training programs in i -Corps, which was really beneficial to me, and have been kind of on the sidelines during those my years with the SBIR program, uh, watching the i -Corps program grow. And, it, and grow, it really has, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But the one thing I want to leave you with before I leave this slide, uh, reducing the risk does not really describe what I would call some of the real benefits of the program. And one of those is that it is absolutely a transformational program. Today, it's really recognized by accelerators like Y Combinator and others as really being kind of a pivotal program in the exploration of a technology uh, along this commercialization path. If you are a participant in this program, you are absolutely changed forever. You will never look at your research, um, any, no matter what the uh, technology core is about, uh, the same way again. So I really encourage you uh, to think about this as one of the key components of translating uh, your technologies and, and from your laboratories of the future uh, using this program. So what is i -Corps? It's actually, I think, very simple to describe. It's really a seven-week entrepreneurial training program. The key to this program initially was to say to uh, scientists and engineers, please get out of the lab and uh, explore your technologies. Of course, uh, the, since March, uh, most of us haven't even been in our labs. So uh, now we say to participants or people considering the program, please get out of your comfort zone, which we think of as your lab, and learn how to evaluate your market opportunity. And, and again, um, the idea being that you can't evaluate your commercial opportunity without talking to people in industry, and especially those that might be the uh, future customers of your technology, about what their needs are and how your technology fits into that industry area. Uh, in the program, in the past, the program was all about travel. The money from NSF uh, would provide awards uh, to people who want to participate. And uh, that money was really used primarily to travel and uh, to participate um, uh, in in-person training sessions. Uh, we have now gone totally virtual, so there's no in-person training. Everything has been converted uh, to uh, online uh, activities and uh, you will not be required to travel, to uh, speak with people. Uh, but we will still ask you to contact at least 100 potential customers or partners or other stakeholders in your uh, industry ecosystem and talk to them about um, your hypotheses uh, about what you're doing. So it's really a very unique uh, program in that sense. Um, and uh, the aims of the program, again, really are to support the commercialization of what we now call deep technologies, a, a term that's used uh, frequently now. Uh, and again, we are interested primarily in technologies that result from uh, discoveries in science and engineering. Uh, our main focus has been on universities and research institutions. However, I, uh, I have been very, very interested in getting uh, researchers from the national labs involved with our program is obviously you are also uh, working on these deep technologies and may want to be able to explore commercialization using this i -Corps program. And again, the whole idea is that uh, most scientists and engineers really have a knowledge and skill gap associated with understanding how to transform their basic research into deep technology ventures. And again, uh, although I, the, the word ventures here, um, for the most part implies uh, maybe a startup company activity, but we are really open to having you explore all possibilities, uh, including relationships with strategic partners or uh, licensing activities. All of those are perfectly uh, legitimate, uh, as we call them now, paths forward from the results that you will gain in the I-Corps program. And again, the, for those that are 
really just starting out in this program, the idea is that you identify specific, specific customer segments and the specific value propositions for your technology for those customers. And again, what you're looking for is to identify a customer that cares about that technology and understanding why they care. And you can see my little sidebar. Uh, one thing to note is that most companies fail because they cannot identify someone that cares about their product. It's not usually a technology failure. All of you are experts in the science and engineering areas that you are engaged in. So it's not usually a technology failure, but more that you have not identified which the customer segments uh, are critical to this and what they actually need and why. So the basic ideas or uh, program basics really are that this is really a real world hands-on experiential learning program that uh, you go through um, as a as a really learning a process about uh, customer and industry discovery. It is based on Steve Blank's uh, Lean Launchpad course at Stanford, which he developed now a little bit more than 10 years ago. I think actually that course uh, may have launched sometime uh, around uh, uh, 2010 or 2011, somewhere in that range. And fortunately, uh, connected with our uh, NSF Errol Arkelich right around that time. So Steve Blank was really uh, instrumental in launching this program at NSF. And, um, and again, it was really a way to quickly assess the commercial interest and feasibility of the technology that you're developing. Um, uh, so the basic tenets of the course are customer discovery method developed by Steve Blank and uh, the use of the business model canvas, which was really popularized by Alex Osterwalder. And, and those um, basic core principles, which uh, again, uh, put forth around the 2011 timeframe are still valid and still being taught today. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit of change gears and talk about uh, uh, this in a more, I'll call it a practical way. Uh, at NSF, if you are interested in NSF's National i Corps program, there are two pathways to eligibility into the program. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the program was first launched with the idea that we would engage NSF-funded researchers, and uh, that is absolutely still true today. Uh, in our program, I would say about half of the participants our NSF funded researchers. Uh, uh, but as we move forward, and, and as the uh, program has always recognized, there are a lot of other great technologies and researchers out there. So there is another pathway uh, to eligibility. And that pathway is uh, through one of our regional i -Corps programs. So if you are a researcher that has had funding from maybe another federal agency, um, uh, uh, or if you are coming from a national lab, uh, you could participate in a regional i -Corps program. We call those programs still today our node and site regional programs are kind of odd terms, but they are also funded by NSF. Nodes are uh, meant to convey that they're uh, a consortium of universities, so it's a little bit larger. A program, a site is an individual university program, and they have um, uh, been funded by NSF to provide regional training to people uh, near them in the program. And not only that, uh, if they are, if you participate in a program, in one of these programs, you uh, would be eligible to receive a recommendation uh, upon completion of that program to NSF's national program. So we still uh, ask, uh, that you have a technology connection to your research institution. Of course, uh, in the case of federal labs, that would definitely be true. And I also just wanted to point out that we have current agreements with other federal agencies, including NASA, DHS, and DOD, uh, where they uh, uh, provide uh, their teams with the opportunity to participate in NSF's i program. Um, and uh, they apply directly to us. 
However, their uh, award for participation actually comes from their federal agency. And uh, so uh, that might be something to consider in the DOE program as well. And uh, finally, I just wanted to tell you that we uh, really have a very strong focus now on identifying teams uh, that are diverse. Uh, we want to uh, really promote the idea of inclusion uh, and it is absolutely a priority for NSF. So if you um, fall into those categories, we are definitely uh, happy that you are interested in applying. All right, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the NSF uh, success uh, uh, statistics. We are just putting together our reports for Congress. We report to Congress uh, every two years. As a matter of fact, uh, Congress has asked us to actually expand uh, this program, um, and uh, we are really delighted to be able to do that. There, uh, to, through our reporting period, which comes now through 2020, the summer cohorts, which cohort is uh, an i -core term, it means our training program, we've trained over 1,900 teams at this point, and uh, that means about uh, a, a little bit over 5,500 uh, participants. Those are the individuals that actually took part in the program. From these, uh, about a thousand or so uh, startup companies have been formed uh, over this time period. And I, I do want to remind you that most teams coming into this program to participate, I'm going to talk about what the word team means in just a second, but most teams come into the program with the idea that they're trying to decide whether to start a, a company around this technology to promote its commercialization. So uh, that has, um, uh, you know, again, been about half of the teams coming into the program. It's really wonderful. And uh, the startup funding for those teams has been $760 million. So substantial amount of pro funding. And again, about half of that funding has come from public funding. What does that mean? That means that they've applied to the SBIR programs primarily to get funding to get their companies off the ground and get that initial uh, proof of concept work conducted. And uh, the remaining half, about 335 million, has come from private sources, uh, such as angel or venture investors. Uh, again, I mentioned that the program launched in 2011, that is the first ideas um, uh, took place then. And it really is now recognized actually worldwide as an extremely effective program uh, and, and uh, promoted as something that's highly worthwhile in most uh, accelerators and incubator programs. All right. Submission uh, mechanics, I wanted to talk about the word, that word team. So it really is a team sort of event. We want you to identify uh, someone that really has the entrepreneurial interests in the uh, and would maybe per perhaps be the one pursuing the commercialization of the technology. Uh, we call them an entrepreneurial lead. We'd also like the person who's invented the technology to participate as the technical lead because they bring a very different perspective. And our teams also include usually someone from outside your uh, organization uh, as a mentor. And uh, we call them the industry mentor because most often they are an industry expert or an industry advisor uh, that really can help the team identify these customer segments and lead them through the process from their own perspective and experience. Um, you, uh, so that's really the first step in thinking about uh, uh, participating in i uh, You might uh, want to participate in a regional i program, receive a letter of recommendation uh, to the national program, uh, and then you would be uh, available to submit or eligible to submit an application through our portal, which I've provided on this slide. And then you will um, uh, next uh, be scheduling an interview with i -Corps staff. It's been a part of our process from the very beginning. We're just kind of checking out your information and uh, uh, advising you about next steps. And we do offer a lot of cohorts for you per year. Uh, last year, we ran about 15 cohorts, uh, but it, it, we run at least three every single cycle, winter, spring, summer, and fall. So a lot of opportunities for you to join a national training program. 
Um, uh, finally, I just want to talk about some of the changes due to COVID. Of course, everything converted to online in March. And in fact, we did not postpone or cancel any of our programs. We switched instantly to an online format. The online format pretty much follows our uh, in-person program, so it has not changed very much at all. And of course, we're still using all of our highly trained uh, i -Corps instructors. And uh, we expect, one of the things I can tell you is that the online training programs, uh, the virtual programs have gone extremely well. I don't know if we would have ever tried this without COVID-19. I'm so glad that we did because one of the things we learned is that uh, the online format works very well for training. We've no, really not lost any of the quality of the in-person training and things have gone extremely well. Uh, by the end of this year, uh, we will have 12 i online training programs under our belt. So it's really, uh, we've really learned a lot and are very excited about going into 2021 with no plans to convert back uh, to in-person training. So at the moment, everything will be virtual. And we also uh, do not require you to travel to do your customer interviews. You can conduct all of your interviews by phone or video conference. Uh, uh, it's really preferred method at this moment uh, due to the, the travel restrictions. So uh, please keep it, that in mind as well. These are big changes to our program because neither of these were thought uh, to uh, be the preferred method for running i -Corps. We've really learned that both work in a very highly effective way. So uh, we're happy to uh, have you join even under these conditions. And I would also just tell you that um, many people uh, uh, feared that the uh, pandemic would reduce the number of applicants to our program. We have never had more applicants to the program than we have now. So if you are interested, uh, please uh, plan for maybe uh, a little bit of lead time before you would get into an i program uh, because of the high demand. All right, that uh, ends my slides. And I think you're taking questions at the end, Susanna. So thank you so much to all of you for listening to me today. It's really been a pleasure being here and I look forward to answering your questions. And of course you may contact me by email, the preferred way at any time if you have additional questions once the program ends today. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was great. And uh, yes, you're correct. We're gonna take questions at the end. And I meant to say in the beginning that if you have any questions that occur to you as the speakers are, on, uh, are presenting, you can write them in the chat um, or you can put them in the Q&A box. I think the only difference there is the chat you can write will be anonymous because you can just write it to the panelists, whereas the Q&A is seen by everybody. So completely up to you. All right. All right. So next we have Christina Tamer, and she oversees VentureWell's early stage innovator programs, supporting the launch of dozens of science and technology startups each year. She manages VentureWell's investment portfolio of 23 companies, which includes two exits to date and has an 80% persistence rate. Previously, she built a portfolio of 18 companies at a seed stage impact investment venture fund and led the expansion of the fund's thesis into agriculture technology. And over to you, Christina. Great. Thank you so much, Susanna. I appreciate you having me here today and giving me the chance to share a little bit about VentureWell. So I will walk through what we've learned at VentureWell over the last 25 years of supporting early stage science and technology innovators. And I'm delighted to follow you, Ruth. Uh, a lot of the lessons learned and, and things that you see, uh, we've definitely seen as well. Uh, need to get out of the building, need to talk to your customers. Uh, so we'll definitely hear some of that in my presentation as well. So as Susanna mentioned, my name is Christina Tamer. I'm a senior program officer at VentureWell. I oversee our early stage innovator programs, uh, but also do a lot of work supporting our other work uh, because we believe that it all uh, works hand in hand to realize our mission. Uh, and our mission is to cultivate a pipeline of inventors, innovators, and entrepreneurs all commonly driven to solve the world's biggest challenges to create a lasting impact. Uh, underlying our work is a deep focus on science and technology. So 
many of our innovators come from universities, uh, both as faculty and students, and we believe in supporting the ecosystem that surrounds them, that creates the enabling environment for them to be successful. Uh, so that includes the institutions, the governments, the other funders uh, that support them, uh, these innovators as well. So we're very collaborative in our approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I mentioned, we're a 25 year old uh, nonprofit organization. So we have uh, a lot of, that we've learned. Uh, so there's the uh, hyperlink here and I can put it in the chat box later to our 25 year anniversary microsite. There's a lot of really great stories and impact data up there. But some highlights to share with you are that we've given away $10 million in grant funding to teams of student uh, inventors and entrepreneurs, uh, student being the undergraduate or graduate level. Across all of our programs, including the grants program, uh, but in others as well, we've supported almost 5,000 teams. Those teams have gone on to support or develop almost 2,000 startups. Those startups have raised over a billion dollars in public and private funding. Uh, in addition, we've also given $12 million in grants to faculty at university campuses to help create innovation and entrepreneurship courses and programs, because we believe that's a great way to seed some of the future entrepreneurs that could be the ones that uh, commercialize some of the research that's happening on campus. And then lastly, uh, we definitely have our roots in higher education and we've worked with over 500 universities across the country, whether in our student grants program, in some of our network programs or in our faculty grants program, and that number uh, continues to go up. We recently conducted a retrospective study to add a little bit more color to those high level stats that I just mentioned. So uh, this study uh, looked at a sample of all of our participants from the E-Team program, which is our student grants program that participated between 2014 and 2018. Uh, we sent out a survey. It had about a 50% response rate from teams. So uh, at least one person from a team responded and a 30% response rate from individuals. And we also followed that up with 28 deep dive interviews with uh, some of the survey uh, respondents. And we published recently, it's on our website, the, the top takeaways and findings uh, that we hope are useful for other entrepreneurial support programs. Um, and, and this work uh, added, as I said, some color to some of those high level stats to what we've learned and what we carry through uh, in, our, in our work and across all of our programs. So those lessons, um, the first one is about the ventures and the startups themselves. So not all entrepreneurship training should be or is the same. Uh, what a consumer web startup in Silicon Valley requires to launch versus what a uh, scientist developing a technology in the lab that requires years of testing and also regulatory approvals is very different. In addition, uh, scientific founders don't always identify as entrepreneurs. They are identifying as a scientist. Uh, and there's a wide range of stages at which a scientists can come into a technology and realize it's a, it is a meaningful product and innovation that someone cares about, that a customer actually cares about, to actually launching a startup. So we see that the trajectory for commercializing innovation is, is long and uh, early, can take a long time, can last for a long time. Uh, so in the absence of measures of success like dollars raised or jobs created, uh, we developed what we call the Venture Development Framework. And it's a tool for both guiding our curriculum design and for evaluating progress for those early, early stage innovators that aren't selling their product yet because they can't, it's not done, it's not regulated, uh, it doesn't work <laughs> at the way the customer needs it to, and maybe they haven't found a business model that works yet. So this framework, uh, is across six different dimensions that we see a startup needs to make progress in in order to become viable. That's the team and venture structures, the technology innovation, separately the intellectual property and how it's protected, the market, the business model, and then the resources, including the financial resources and the human capital resources. Uh, as a startup grows and makes progress, uh, we see them filling out those, those circles uh, closer to the outer edges certainly progress is not linear and it's not per perfect, it's not easy. So sometimes a startup, so this is an example um, of one of our startups. When they enter the program, this is where we place them on our venture development framework. And you can see that they, they'd made progress. Uh, the outer circles being filled basically represents that they're ready to go out and begin selling, begin fundraising money from private investors and, and ready to basically be a, a grown up startup as we call them. Uh, so you can see 
progress is not made in lockstep. Um, sometimes things get completed faster than other things. Uh, and you generally will see that a startup is around a similar stage. You know, they might have one to two circles completed, um, but sometimes they can be more advanced uh, in some uh, compared to others. So we do this evaluation and consider that when it, with any startup and any program we're designing, to make sure that we're meeting the scientific founders where they are. It's important to develop the appropriate uh, mm -hmm. examples. You know, what types of companies are you featuring? Are they representative of the, of the people who are in the room mm -hmm. when you're using those examples? And also to make sure that uh, the, the stage gate is appropriate. The second thing that we've learned and we've seen consistently is that uh, the people come first. When an institution or a venture uh, doesn't work out or someone leaves, the, leaves their role at a, at a university, uh, the people and the relationships and the networks and the skills that you've taught them or brought to them uh, still, still are there. So we really prioritize uh, and highly value any work that we do that cultivates uh, an individual's learning and their own entrepreneurial mindset and their own skills. Uh, as I said, mentors d don't always work out and that's okay. In fact, we want similar to the i program, want them to get to a no uh, if that's where they will ultimately end up. Uh, we don't want them to spend years and years of time on a technology or a market that just isn't there. So the people, the value that, that we uh, create for them, we value significantly because that lasts long after the startup. In our study, in our retrospective study that I mentioned, um, we also see that um, when an entrepreneur or an innovator has a chance to intentionally think about their career pathway, um, we saw a higher satisfaction rate with their careers compared to a national study. So 57% of our survey respondents said that they found meaningful career paths um, opposed to 40% from a national study. In addition, even when a startup doesn't work out, uh, that doesn't mean that that startup or that entrepreneur or innovator is done with entrepreneurship. They could go on to another one. So we saw that 81% of our survey respondents were either working on a venture or planning to start another one uh, in the future. So providing entrepreneurship training or innovation training does fundamentally create more talent for the innovation economy. Uh, so even if that startup doesn't work out, there's still a lot of value to be gained uh, from that person going forward. And lastly, uh, you know, none of this happens in isolation or in a vacuum. So, you know, you need to talk to your customers, you need to work with industry, you need to understand the problem. So to that end, VentureWell is deeply committed to supporting our colleagues in the, in the space to uh, make, amplify their work, to provide the backbone support that's required. Um, just like we see uh, our entrepreneurs going out and trying to find ways to add value to their customers, to add value to partners, to find the right investors that are a match. Uh, we see that they're embedded in our programs. And uh, if you can help the network overall, um, it creates a better enabling environment for those innovators to thrive. So we find, again, even if, a, if an entrepreneur isn't uh, continuing to be involved in their startup, they often go on to work in uh, work with the partners they might have spoken to, work with that prospective customer, work as an instructor or a faculty member in innovation and, and entrepreneurship uh, in the university setting. So none of this happens in a vacuum. Everything is correlated. Uh, so that guides our strategic work uh, in why we do a lot of um, network support with our, with our colleagues in the space. So just to sum summarize our work, there's a lot that I could spend many hours on uh, talking about each specific program. But to share the high level details, we see our work in three bu broad buckets right now. Uh, one is supporting the development of innovation and entrepreneurship in higher education institutions. We do that pro by providing grants, workshops and trainings, uh, conferences and, and convenings. We also provide the direct innovator support uh, to those early stage entrepreneurs. We do that through our own workshops, uh, collaborating with partners to deliver their workshops, and also some funding, including grants, prizes, and investments. And lastly, as I mentioned, we are trying to support and strengthen the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem by providing network facilitation, other convenings, backbone support, knowledge transfer, and capacity building. 
Uh, and this is all made possible through the funders that VentureWell is fortunate to work with. Uh, the Lemelson Foundation is our original funder. Uh, we got started together 25 years ago. The Lemelson Foundation is to committing, committed to supporting invention uh, and invention mm -hmm. for impact. Uh, so our missions have been in lockstep uh, for the last 25 years and we're uh, pleased to still have them as a close uh, collaborator and partner today. And then we also work with many federal agencies, including the National Science Foundation, as I mentioned, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of State, and USAID, along with a variety of philanthropic funders and uh, corporate partners as well. Um, we have previously worked with the Department of Energy on the Clean Tech University Prize Program as well. Uh, so this list uh, is always growing and we're, we're very proud of the high caliber of partners that we are able to work with to support uh, all of our efforts and our common missions as well. Just to zero in a little bit on some of the higher education work, because I do think that's of interest to many of you on this call. Uh, we do offer grants to faculty, as I said, of up to 30K to develop uh, courses and programs that will help uh, embed innovation and entrepreneurship onto campus more deeply. Uh, we also convene annually in our open conference, uh, all the different innovation and entrepreneurship educators. Um, we have about 300 to 500 different uh, participants uh, in this conference each year. Uh, it's held usually annually in March. We also offer direct trainings to educators. So the Lean, Start, the Lean Launchpad for educators and also the Green Launchpad for educators uh, with a sustainable design twist. And we also offer virtual convenings and communities of practice uh, around certain topical areas. So engineering one planet, convening groups for minority serving institutions, sustainable design, and previously the pathways to innovation with uh, Stanford's Epicenter. Uh, to spotlight a little bit of the impact that the faculty grants program has made, um, we've given over $12 million uh, in grants to over 500 unique faculty, faculty PIs. 240 campuses have participated uh, and they've impacted tens of thousands of students. And we conducted another retrospective study recently and we found uh, with our faculty grantees that 80% of those courses that we funded are still being offered. So we're really pleased that the faculty are able to find ways to uh, embed this into the campus um, infrastructure and the fabric of the innovation and entrepreneurship culture uh, and usually leverage our funding, which is about 30K typically, for additional funding to, to make the course uh, a long lasting. On the early stage innovator side, this is my sweet spot and where I, I work uh, most frequently. Our E-Team program offers multiple stages of grants and funding for student entrepreneurs. As I mentioned, it's both graduate level and undergraduate level. Um, we also leverage that curriculum to provide our training to other, other grantees as well. So for example, the USAID Grant Challenges Program uh, that also works in collaboration with other funders uh, specific to the Grand Challenge. We run what's called the Accelerator Program for those grantees. We also work closely with the Department of State to run the GIST, which is Global Innovation Through Science and Technology uh, Boot Camps Program. Those are held in countries all around the world to support global uh, science and technology innovators and startups. And then lastly, we work closely with uh, Ruth and her colleagues at NSF to deliver uh, and evaluate the NSF i program and similarly the i at the National Institutes of Health program as well. So to spotlight some of our early stage innovator work. Uh, this is the, the outline of the E-Team e program. There's multiple stages. It starts out with a $5,000 grant and then goes on to a $20,000 grant. There's specific trainings associated with each of them. It does definitely include lean startup principles, among other things. We do a lot of focus, as I mentioned, on the individual, on the ecosystems, um, and on the founding team uh, it, itself. So as I mentioned, a lot of times they don't even know they want to be an entrepreneur yet. So we're helping to develop that mindset. So in this program, uh, since 1996, we've given $10 million in grants. Um, in starting in 2013, we made the, the training a requirement for all grantees. So we've trained over a thousand individuals uh, since then. And across both the grants and the training programs, uh, we've uh, helped start uh, 366 startups and they've raised uh, 440 million in public and private funding. 
so it's a, a little bit less than half of the, the total funding that we see um, our overall venture well uh, startups have raised. And lastly, I'll speak to the, the network and ecosystem work that we do. Uh, we work closely with the NSF again here on the industry university cooperative research program to help uh, with contractual obligations, uh, evaluation and reporting uh, for these centers that are providing connections between industry, academia and government uh, to help guide uh, the research that's uh, being done to make sure it's industry relevant. We also work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the Frontier Set program to help uh, improve uh, retention outcomes for underrepresented students um, at the higher education level. Uh, and we also run the Just Innovation Hubs program with the U.S. Department of State supporting local incubators uh, in, in 37 different countries around the world, um, helping them with programming, helping them connect to each other and helping them support their innovators. And then lastly, uh, and most recently, uh, we have started supporting the National Institutes of Health Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Program, or RADx. Uh, this program was launched in April to very quickly find and develop and then scale up innovative stars cov 2 tests. Um, so we uh, support the facilitation of this program by helping funnel the awards, uh, recruit and managing a diverse pool of technical advisors to help these different uh, tests and the startups behind them and or the companies behind them to quickly uh, vet and get to the point of manufacturing uh, these tests. This is the funnel for the RADx program. So this just started on April 29th this year. They've received 716 applications uh, and that's funneled down to 22 phase two uh, awards worth over, uh, worth, ne worth nearly half a billion dollars, half a billion. Uh, the overall program is over a billion dollars. It's a really significant effort. Uh, and the goal is to start uh, deploying tests early next year uh, in, at the rate of about a million tests per day. Uh, so this is the, the NIH's uh, response to try to rapidly develop uh, testing uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. And VentureWell has been pleased to play a role in this to help uh, connect our resources and our greater network to support these companies that are trying to quickly uh, respond to this problem. So you can see it's a pretty wide range of work, uh, whether we're supporting faculty or supporting very, very large initiatives uh, or supporting the innovators themselves. Um, we're committed to doing what it takes to realize our mission of cultivating that pipeline of inventors and innovators solving the world's biggest problems, uh, whether they're current problems in your face that were unexpected or those long-standing um, instilled problems uh, in, our, in our society. Uh, we feel that both are important and we're, we're happy to play a role. So uh, a quick plug here for our annual open conference. It's coming up in March. It will be virtual. Uh, and then please don't hesitate to reach out if you're interested in any of our grants or interested in collaboration opportunities. Um, our website also has details on those retrospective studies I mentioned and uh, that really nice 25th anniversary uh, microsite with some nice stories on it. So my contact information is up there and I'm happy to answer questions and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Christina. That was a great overview of all the great work you, that you do. So last but not least, um, we have Siobhan Delea and uh, after that we'll have questions. So as CEO of Mass Challenge, Siobhan sets and manages strategy for Mass Challenge, the largest zero equity startup accelerator in the world. Launched in Boston, Massachusetts in 2009, Mass Challenge's network has grown to include six early stage accelerators and two vertical accelerators. It has supported the growth of startup ecosystems across five continents and has partnered with hundreds of organizations to grow their innovation agendas. Before joining Mass Challenge, Siobhan served as the C, uh, Chief Growth Officer for the Gromit, an online marketplace and product discovery platform where she was responsible for the wholesale business and programs to support entrepreneur growth. She was also a founding team member of C Space, where she grew the company's workforce to nearly 500 employees and supported significant growth and expansion over her 16 year tenure. As Global Chief Client Officer, Siobhan led the integration across acquired companies in the UK and China. And with that, I'll let you take over. Thank you.
Siobhan, I think you're on mute. How's that? There we go. Okay, so wasn't on mute, which is such a rookie mistake, but there was something wrong with my audio nonetheless. So sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, um, so thank you. my name's Siobhan DeLay. I'm also here with a colleague, Rebecca Burns, who is on the call, but she will most likely be joining in for the Q&A piece. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through, through a few things to tell you about Mass Challenge. Um, some introductions to who we are, a, a little deeper dive, some how we do what we do, um, some activities that we're doing in the US uh, and some spotlights on some of our partners. So uh, we have a similar, it, it's not the same mission but um, and vision, but what I liked about the different people that we're talking today is that we're all about uh, a stronger future, uh, solving massive challenges and uh, mass challenges here because we, we do what we do because we believe that collaborative innovation creates a stronger future. And we focus specifically on entrepreneurs who are disrupting the status quo and will create meaningful change in the world. Uh, I'm going to play a quick video to help you understand a little bit more about what we do. We're living in a time of change changes to our daily lives, to the most basic ways in which we collaborate and innovate. But one thing will never change, the need for innovation. For the next generation of transformational businesses to show us the way forward, for the boldest of entrepreneurs to disrupt the status quo and create meaningful change. At Mass Challenge, this is what drives us. Starting a business isn't for everyone. It takes guts, tenacity, and a full belief in your passion. It takes skill, foresight, and yeah, some luck. It isn't easy, but these entrepreneurs, they're ready ready to build a better future, to move the world forward, ready to go to work. At Mass Challenge, we know the value of community. And since 2009, we've harnessed the collective power of the global innovation community to grow and transform businesses and economies. More than 2,000 alumni companies, $6 billion of funding raised, 150,000 jobs created, and an unparalleled network of partners, mentors, dreamers, and doers. So what are you waiting for? You've got the will. Together, let's find the way. So I'm um, sorry if you had trouble. I, I saw in the chat a few people had trouble with volume. Hopefully you heard that. I wanted to show you the uh, extent to which we, uh, the, the passion with what, with, around what we do. Let me tell you a little bit more about Mass Challenge. We've been in business for about 10 years. Uh, we have nine accelerator programs around the world and we work with local economies to uh, support their innovation, um, their innovation um, through bridge to mass challenge programs where we help them both locally drive innovation, but also connect them to larger markets to expand their businesses. Our, our focus really is on uh, connecting these startups with the resources, partnerships, and uh, communities to help them launch and grow. We have three types of programs that we do around the world early stage. Those are um, might be pre-revenue across all industries. Um, uh, vertical programs, which are challenge-based, where are usually corporate, but could be government partners, 
uh, announce some challenges and we recruit and source startups who can directly address those challenges. And we work with them over six months through proof of concept, pilot, sometimes a paid pilot or strategic advisory work with those enterprises. And then there's that bridge to mass challenge I mentioned where we work with local ecosystems to help connect them to larger markets or just help them build their ecosystem locally and look at things like policy or, um, or resources they might need to build a local ecosystem. We measure our results based on our startups results and similar to, to what you've seen today over the past uh, 10 years would have accelerated around 20, a little over 2,400 startups. Those startups have created 157,000 jobs. Um, they have generated over $3 billion in revenue and raised funding of $6.2 billion, which says that others believe in them as well. We really focus on trying to do better than the general um, uh, industry in terms of inclusion and diversity. Um, last, uh, in 2020, uh, a little over 42% of the startups we accelerated, which was in around 400, had at least one female founder. And in the, the other side of your screen, you'll see that almost a fourth had at least one founder who was black or indigenous person of color. Um, we focus uh, on that because uh, those are the groups that are most underrepresented in the tech industry. And one thing we're really proud of is the number of startups that we've accelerated that are still active, over 84% and a little over 5% have been acquired. We have different focus areas. So I mentioned across our early stage, we're industry agnostic, but we do have uh, certain focus areas um, that we uh, create more community around. So mentors, uh, partners that support and industry expertise. So some of the ones we're looking at right, we're working with right now are Blue Tech. That's based out of our uh, Rhode Island program, but it crosses the U.S. Uh, safety and security, I'll say more uh, about that uh, later that's based in both our Austin and Boston program. Mobility, which is focused really or led out of our Boston program, is focused on enabling, uh, so mobility in the context of the movement of people and goods in a sustainable and resilient way. Enterprise technology, and then space technology. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the commercialization uh, in space. So to talk more about the mechanics of what we do, um, uh, we are a nonprofit. So everything we do, we focus on the startup. So uh, some accelerators take equity from the startup because we're a nonprofit, we don't need to do that. We fund ourselves in a different way. So we're focused on how to um, uh, globally help uh, innovation ecosystems uh, through uh, entrepreneurs. We, uh, that zero equity nonprofit status sort of gives us the right to really collaborate or cooperate with uh, different entrepreneurial support organizations. When we run our accelerator, it's pretty in depth. So, but we uh, do it in sort of four phases. We source the startups. We find startups around the world who might Ha, uh, be addressing a specific challenge, as I mentioned, for our vertical programs where there's a challenge that uh, was put out and we're looking for entrepreneurs who can address that challenge or just generally looking for high quality and various, um, various startups to apply. Um, from those thousands of applications, I think this past year we had about 3,000, we usually in invite about 10% uh, end up being in our cohort, but we vet them through a series of judging steps. And those judges aren't mass challenge judges. Those judges are from the community. So again, it, these are volunteers. I was one when I was an entrepreneur who are specialists in different <clears throat> domain areas or entrepreneurs, or they might be specialists in law or IP or 
accounting or finance. And they go through what we call round one judging, which is an online judging process. And everyone who applies gets at least reviewed by five experts and they get at least 30 words of feedback on their business. So even if uh, startups are just applying, they're getting feedback from experts, even if they don't make it to the next round of judging. The next round of judging, which we call round two, is in-person judging, or this year it was virtual via Zoom, but it's live judging. We select people who we invite to our cohort. We're accelerating about 400 to 450 startups a year globally. We focus on sort of mass customization. We focus on what the startup's needs are, assess those, link them to the resources, follow up with uh, goals and milestone and everything we're doing, whether it's coaching, curriculum, or programming, it's based on what their needs are, but also 10 years of data that where we've linked what we've done to results. So it's evidence-based acceleration. Uh, the outcomes are at the end of the program. We uh, again do some final judging. We give out equity free prizes, celebrate, but we continue that relationship beyond the time that we're together or this year, like NSF, as Ruth said, we, um, we pivoted to virtual very quickly. So to summarize what our startups get from working with us, connections with experts and mentors that last much longer than the four months that they're in the acceleration, access to different ecosystems because we're in nine different markets, actually more if you talk about the bridge to mass challenge work, we can link people around the world. We connect them to some VIPs. We had last week, we had a founder from Netflix talk to our mass challenge Mexico cohort at their finale event. We had Ariana Huffington in for our US. Uh, we have some um, pretty uh, entrepreneurs like to give back and we've been lucky enough to invite some who have said yes and connected with entrepreneurs to give them wisdom. The zero cause, zero equity means startups don't need to get, give up any of their precious equity or pay to be part of our programs. Uh, Evidence-based and terrible curriculum I talked about. And not only do they not have to pay, sometimes we can get scholarships funded, especially if we do in-person work and there's travel um, provided, or they might get in-kind deals like not have to pay for any Azure as they develop their Microsoft products or um, Amazon Web Services as they're developing their products. We approach, while we're an accelerator, we approach what we do from an ecosystem point of view. So we know that um, the greatest accelerator program is not going to be as effective if it's not connected to densely connected local innovation ecosystem. So Venture Wells in our innovation ecosystem in Massachusetts, and we I'm sure have lots of stories where we've supported some of the same entrepreneurs. And that's a good thing because entrepreneurs should get support across the ecosystem, whether it's government, corporations, industry as I've heard them referred to on this call, investors, universities certainly trying to help get some of the technology out of the lab and, and commercialized uh, and others in the broader community, whether it's um, it's having the conversations of being able to influence government policy. Um, like I think um, someone earlier in this call talked about uh, conflict of interests. Um, we sometimes represent the entrepreneur to the government and say, uh, conflict of interest policies shouldn't be uh, in place in Massachusetts because it stops innovation from happening because people can't work for a similar technology. So we're not lobbyists, but we often represent startups because we hear their voice and listen to them and advocate for them, whether it's with the government for policy or working with businesses to help them be more startup ready so that they can be more friendly and uh, work with them more effectively, or working really closely with universities to find out how we can support the technology coming out of their labs. We often work with cities or states. While we're a global uh, organization, we work with cities or states 
to um, to help build their build their local ecosystem and support their startups. I'm going to move along fast because I think we're moving to Q and A soon. Um, one of the things we do, why we work with cities, is um, to help them create jobs. Small businesses create new jobs at a faster rate than larger established organizations. It's also really important as uh, talent moves, for, leaves one uh, startup, uh, they, we want them to stay in the ecosystem and not leave. Uh, it can also help with regional competitiveness. Right now at the city of Boston, we're actually helping to attract uh, FinTech startups who can help them with challenges around, um, around the unbanked. Uh, I'll go through some uh, partner stories rather quickly for you. Um, we have, I think it's 100 corporate partners worldwide, and we also work really closely with universities, foundations, and government. We have a few uh, partners I was going to highlight. We work with the Air Force Lab in three different ways. We work with the Air Force in three different ways. Here is mentioned the lab, but we work with them on a Banshee program where we uh, teach their uh, purchasers how to buy or look for technology from entrepreneurs or smaller, earlier stage entrepreneurs so, because they're really trained on how to work with prime contractors. But if they want to really innovate, they have to keep things open. Um, so we train them on that. We have a safety and security track where we help them look for startups who can uh, support national security challenges uh, and get them into an SBIR program. And the third, U US Air Force Lab, we're helping the Air Force uh, have a better, uh, better um, positive rate for moving from SBIR 1 to SBIR 2. And we've been able to do that really successfully in our expanding that program. Another uh, partner that's pretty interesting. It used to be called CASIS, but now it's um, the International Space Station National Lab. We've been working with them since 2013. And we match them with startups, but they also provide grants to startups that they think could benefit from uh, conducting experiments in space. One company, Lambda Vision, who is creating, uh, who created a protein-based artificial retina to restore vision to people who, um, are blinded by our retinal degenerative diseases, um, started, uh, got a grant from the International Space Station and was able to do research that they couldn't do in environments with gravity, but the microgravity environment helped them to um, uh, create, a, create a research process where sedimentation didn't impact what they were doing and they didn't have to think about spray dipping or spin coating and worry about the impact of gravity there. So it was something that they didn't even think of without this sort of introduction and grant, they never would have put it, um, they never would have considered doing something like that. Our partners benefit because they have, get access to high growth, high impact startups. Uh, they get engagement across the innovation ecosystem. So we introduce them to each other so that they can work together as well. Um, they might get curated uh, competitions or demo days. Uh, some care about being known as innovators, so the branding and PR associated with it are important to them. Went really fast, um, open to any uh, Q&A uh, at the end. And if you have additional questions you want to reach out to us afterwards, Rebecca's emails here. Thanks so much. Back to thank you, Susanna. You. Oh, thank you, Siobhan. So I uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers. I really appreciate it. And looks like we have a little bit more over 20 minutes for Q&A. And I'm going to turn it over to Victoria Stefano, who is a AAAS policy fellow in our office. Wonderful presentations, everyone. I'm really looking forward to our Q&A session. So I'm going to start us off right from some questions in the chat. Um, there's been a lot of interest around how DOE laboratories can and do work with universities. Can you comment a little bit about um, how they can do this effectively and productively? 
Sure, I'll, I'll jump in on this. Um, so one example, and actually it's a DOE lab, um, is the uh, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Um, and so that, that is an office kind of within Princeton, although it's separate. Uh, and that's a great example of, of that separate office that has a tech transfer office working with the Princeton uh, writ large uh, tech transfer office. Um, and, and that's been a, a really effective method. You know, nowadays, again, I mentioned earlier, just with multidisciplinary research, uh, it, it's just happening more and more organically. It's not even happening at the, at the technology transfer levels. It's happening at the researcher levels, which, which is fantastic. Um, I, I don't know if my other panelists have, have other uh, examples. Okay, well, I can go ahead and move on to the next question. We have a question specifically for Ruth in the i -Corps program. Um, Manny says, I'm curious to your long-term plans for i -Corps with regards to travel. Beyond 2021, will you be returning to travel for either training or customer visit? First of all, hi, Manny. I haven't seen you for a while. Nice to hear of a question from you this afternoon. Uh, you know, uh, at this moment, I guess in terms of in-person training, for i we have no plans to return to in-person in 2021. I think we'll stop at the end of the year next year and evaluate uh, in-person. But I would just say again, our uh, virtual training has gone much better than we expected. Uh, actually, maybe parts of that training are better in the virtual world than they were in person. So uh, it will be kind of a tough consideration. Uh, regarding travel for interviews, uh, that's kind of a different question. First of all, it's uh, up to the universities, for example, or organizations to guide that. And at the moment, ever, it's only essential travel. So we haven't seen that. Uh, but I would say just from our experience of running these uh, programs this year, um, th there is probably an advantage to being able to allow in-person travel, especially to conferences or to industrial sites. And especially if you are a student or postdoc or a person who has not traveled the world, uh, doing the in-person travel, I think really does have some benefits. So we're, we'd be delighted to have our travel restrictions lifted and allow in-person uh, interviews again. Uh, although I will just tell you, I doubt whether we'll ever go back to making them an absolute requirement. So we probably will always allow people to do a uh, phone and video conference. One of the things that I didn't mention that I think is worth mentioning here that we were really, uh, I would call unaware of prior to the pandemic is that when we became virtual, I had a flood of email from, uh, from people who have disabilities that are now allowed to participate because of the virtual program. I was really moved by that. And I'm gonna tell you that I doubt whether we will ever require travel again because we've had uh, a whole, this whole program has been opened up to uh, groups that otherwise would not have been able to participate. So I really, really like that. So we'll continue that aspect of it. I can add, the, add to that too. I know the question was there, but we did learn that in addition to people with disabilities, there are people who would be unable to travel because they oh, yeah, work right. during the day, can't afford, yeah. can't go to things uh, during the day, uh, build their business at night, or they are building their business and they don't have time. So our attendance has been up more than any other year. Yeah, so Siobhan, we'll yeah, have some, something, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, that's a really good point. And uh, since our main group are academics, you know, are people in laboratories that maybe that don't um, have the time, want to take the time to travel, uh, I think with this fact that we do not require travel at the moment has really increased our participation as well. So it's just been a real plus. I don't think we would have tried it without the pandemic. So I guess there's always a little bit of a silver lining. Thank you for the question, Manny. So um, a lot of our audience is maybe national lab scientists and kind of, can we, can you talk about the avenues for national lab scientists to be engaged in entrepreneurship activities? Well, I mean, I do think that the, you know, some of the programs that we've been talking about 
have not been as available to the national lab. So we're here because we would love to encourage participation. Uh, we still might have to work out some of the details for that participation, but I'm very excited about it. Uh, I could add that one of our i uh, regional programs, a node program, actually uh, contacted me about collaborating with the national lab this year. And of course, we were uh, very much encouraged that activity, but, um, I would love to expand this to all national labs that are interested in exploring uh, translation of their work and participating in the i -Corps program. So not, it may take uh, conversations about how to make that happen, but we are definitely open for that uh, activity, uh, especially as we go into 2021. Yep. And if I could add to that, I mentioned earlier um, the Federal Laboratory Consortium. That is a wonderful resource um, for both tech transfer professionals within the federal lab system as well as those inventors. So uh, I think that's a, a wonderful resource for those uh, researchers on the call. And as a twofer, um, Autumn actually is working very closely with the FLC. So you also get that the continued um, uh, resources of Autumn as well. So, uh, and, and actually to follow on um, both uh, Ruth and, and Siobhan's comment uh, on um, uh, expansion of attendance, we've seen the exact same thing uh, now in, in a virtual setting. And what's interesting, and I think it's been alluded to a couple times during this call, um, is, is this idea of uh, expanding the diversity of the innovation pipeline. Um, that, that's a crucial national concern um, and uh, societal concern. And so we're actually seeing exactly what, what you're describing, which is um, uh, that the attendees are, are more diverse than ever um, uh, in, in background, ethnicity, um, uh, all sorts of uh, different um, uh, areas, which I think is really positive. And I think it just goes back to Ruth's comment. Um, yes, we're going to have in-person meetings again soon, uh, but that will not be the only way to, to interact. And I think it's important for us to realize that. So we engage as, as wide a swath of uh, innovators uh, in our ecosystem. I just wanted to jump in and, and ask uh, Mass Challenge and Venture Well um, whether you had any DOE researchers participate in any of your programs or if you knew um, offhand if that was possible. Um, this may be, have been a better question for Connor, but. Um. Yeah, there's definitely been um, some research that's been tied, like has had historical ties to DOE labs or, or labs in general um, that have come through our program. So, uh, for the student grants program that we run, uh, it doesn't have to be their IP, like the student's IP that they're developing. It could come from a lab or from a faculty member. So we've definitely seen a few examples of that. Uh, and then in some of our other programs, um, the, the, the fellowship program that uh, like Lawrence Berkeley National Labs runs with Cyclotron Road, now called Activate, uh, many of those participants have come through our um, investment readiness program. So we do allow uh, startups to enter some of the later stages of that E-team program that I, that I mentioned if they don't come from a, uh, you know, if they're not actively students. So we do open up the pipeline for them as well. Yeah. I don't know the answer to what, where, whether the, um, the research technology that are at the core of the startups came from uh, the DOE labs or other ones. I know that most of the, especially the high tech or scientific ones do, but I don't know specifically. So this might be a question for Autumn, but this, uh, uh, Manny also asked, how do federal labs compare with universities when looking at tech transfer outputs, uh, including startups, license products uh, per research dollar expended? Uh, it's the quote of 2020. Um, yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a great question. So Autumn does track this data in a macro format. Um, so what we found is on average, um, $2.7 million of research leads to a single invention. And then from there, you can kind of calculate out number of patents, number of um, products. Um, I, we don't have a rich enough data set for federal labs 
to make a clear determination of, of what that number looks like. Um, I would imagine perhaps Connor and others within the DOE system uh, have uh, better um, uh, numbers related to that. Although the, the one caution I would make is, and, and we see this with university data alone, uh, whether you're talking about a school with a medical school um, or a liberal arts school, the, the actual percentages are going to be really different. And that's okay. Um, each one has their own unique soil, unique e ecosystem. Uh, and so perhaps my guidance would be to focus on direction of travel. Um, is that percentage uh, increasing? Um, so is it taking less research funding to lead to an invention? Um, it, that's kind of the direction I, I'd imagine to see. If I had to guess offhand, I would say, given the huge size and scope of some of the research projects at the federal labs, um, I, I would imagine that number, um, it, it probably is more research funding per invention, just given the, the sheer infrastructure. Um, uh, concerns um, and, and requirements uh, there. Um, so my next question is um, kind of around this idea of uh, innovation ecosystems, which is a lot of our conversation in our last uh, kind of Labs of the Future workshop kind of touched on this. So are there some strategies to build these innovation ecosystems in especially regionally isolated areas, which is some of where our labs are located? Yeah, it, it, it's tricky, right? Because um, uh, what I've seen for, uh, because uh, it's about density, it's about connection, and it's about, um, and some of that has some geographical link to it. So I've certainly seen successful hub and spoke, uh, usually a tech center with, um, with, well, universities, what you're talking about, would have the lab and the technology, but there needs to be some, what often happens is when uh, a place grows, then it gets more dense and there's more population. Because when you're thinking about, when I was talking about jobs, it's not only the jobs that the entrepreneurs and the tech industry creates, it's the jobs that surround that, that bubble up because they're humans. Humans eat, humans live, humans do, do others. So I've, I've not seen a strong innovation ecosystem in a rural location. What it'd say is that the, those usually grow up if they, they do that. The, the other is, um, I think what we're really looking at to help regions is to, uh, to expand larger beyond the um, local tech center to have the connections, especially in a virtual world that helps build those jobs, not just there. But I doubt it's going to, I doubt the center of the innovation ecosystem will be in that rural area. But what I hope is they'll be able to participate in a regional innovation ecosystem. I'm open to what other people say, but that's all the, the research that I've I've seen in the experience that I have there. Yeah, I would uh, just add a bit, uh, regarding the ICAR program. First of all, we've had teams from every single state in the country. So uh, that has really been great, you know, even very remote places like Alaska, for example. So it's really great uh, for our program. I think, again, the pandemic has been wonderful because many of our regional, again, I mentioned uh, nine nodes and 99 site programs, and we're now adding our new hubs program. Uh, all of these have the core tenant that we want to reach people in remote locations. Um, many of the regional programs were also in-person training. I think they've all converted as well now to online. So it's really going to give people the opportunity to connect regionally and still be able to participate in a virtual program. So we're, I think this has really been a great thing and we look forward to continuing to do that. Yeah, and if I can add to that, um, so uh, the, the data that, that Autumn's been collecting, including startup data, what we've actually found is seven over 70% 70 of all startup companies remain headquartered in the location uh, of the uh, the university, the, the states, uh, the university where, the, um, or the state that the university hailed from, and so what that says to me um, is yes, there is a draw to to the coasts, 
but there are great swaths of the country that have uh, really functionable, uh, functioning uh, startup companies throughout. When I think about startup companies, you kind of need the technology, you need the money, and you need the people. Um, that's, that's kind of the three main elements of the way I think about it. And so again, if they're, if they're centered around universities or federal labs, you've got the technology there. Um, you know, generally in communities, you have the money and, and, and with, you know, fortunately with, with programs like VentureWell and, and others um, to support, there's, there's funding to be accessible. And then in terms of people, uh, tapping into um, uh, the alumni networks has been really helpful. Uh, and so when I was at Wake, that, that's what we used to do. We, we'd have a CEO that was a, a Wake alum. We'd have funders that came from Wake. Um, and the company would be staffed in part by community college graduates uh, from the area. And so that was in you know, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, not, not Boston. Um, so this is an area that um, it, it really is throughout the country, recognizing that there's a gravitation towards the coasts. Well, yeah, I, I think that actually, to, to clarify what I meant by tech center or specific center, th there is great entrepreneurial work right now in Kansas City. Tulsa, Oklahoma is doing it. Salt Lake City is, there's a lot exploding. Tennessee has a lot. So it's definitely, it's not, it's not just the coast, I don't think, although, you know, that's traditionally what people think when you're thinking about the tech bro with the hoodie, but it's not that. It's, it's, there's, there's entrepreneurship everywhere. I, I guess to, to clarify, you can be an entrepreneur anywhere, but you do need to get connected where the people, the funding and the technology live. You need to be connected there. There's not going to be a Silicon Valley in a rural location. You have to be connected into some sort of tech center. Um, but I'm really encouraged to see it's not a coast thing anymore. It's really um, everywhere, as, as you all said as well. Yeah. Oh, just one thing I was thinking while you're talking, Siobhan, that we've started to use the term we want to democratize entrepreneurship now and so we really mean that uh, and that means spreading into the rural areas and making it available to everyone so um i have another question um how can national labs of the future navigate issues of science security for tech transfer considering that there are many uh collaborations with foreign researchers So Susanna, I'll, I'll jump in on this. So, you know, this is an area that, that also uh, touches universities, of course. Um, uh, some of our, our researchers might not be um, uh, born in, in the US uh, or, or US citizens. So um, there, there are mechanisms by which you handle this. So again, it's, it's managing um, potential conflicts. And so there are ways that these are addressed. Um, uh, and, and so, the important part is to make sure that you have leadership from the top that, um, e e that hopefully supports that type of uh, innovation um, uh, across a different, um, both the federal lab and say university. And, and I think that's, that's what I'm hearing um, from, from DOE, which I think is really important. Yes, that is something that always has to be considered and addressed, but there are mechanisms and ways to address that. Um, to, and so uh, one of the things I think about is one of our autumn plenary speakers years ago was a retired poker pro. And the reason we brought him in was because we wanted him to show that risk is not risky or not. It's not binary. There, there's a whole gradation along the way. And so again, understanding what your risk is, if you call that hand, is the same as um, addressing security risks. You need to know what the potential threat is and then therefore uh, uh, address it as opposed to saying it's risky, never mind. So I think we maybe have time for one more question, Susanna. Um, so I'm going to try to get this in here. Um, so does the FFR DC designation, which is at the, our DOE laboratories, uh, most of them have, does that in any way inhibit or um, kind of prevent tech transfer? I don't, uh, we work with, isn't MITRE and uh, an FFR, we, we work with um, 
those types of organizations and I haven't seen any, you may know better, but I, I think they're quite innovative and, and pretty, um, pretty significantly impacting innovation. That's been my experience as, as well. And, and maybe there's some things internally that, that we're not aware of, but uh, that, that's my experience as well. What, whether it's Argonne or Sandia, uh, you give a whole host. Yeah, unfortunately, Connor is not here to answer this question, but I, I, you know, they're not government labs, which certainly helps. So they, they have fewer restrictions than if they were federal employees. There are still, you know, various rules. And I think Connor spoke to some of the ones that we've been, uh, we, the Royal, we have been trying to make sure are as rational as possible and not overly constraining, um, you know, dealing with conflicts of interest and the like, but yeah, we there's plenty of great IP that comes out of the labs that is you know patented and then licensed and ultimately commercialized. So there's nothing inherently preventing them from doing that as FFRDCs. Wow. Okay, so we are going to finish right on time. Um, so thankful to all of you for participating today. This has been an excellent panel, and I know you have to go, Siobhan. So. Um, but thank you again. And, you know, I'm gonna, if you would, don't mind sending me your presentations, I can share them with all the participants. And I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Thank you.